Welcome to the Knowledge Base Ninjas Podcast, where Gallery Ram Kumar of Document 360 finds the best SaaS self service knowledge bases in the world and then interviews their creators. Let's get started with today's episode. Good day, everyone. Our guest today is Mike Pop, Technical Editor at Google. Welcome, Mike, to the Knowledge Base Ninjas Podcast. How are you doing today? Great. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Fantastic. So, Mike, please help us understand a little bit about yourself and how did you get into documentation initially? A little bit about your profile at uh, Google currently. So, working backwards right now, I work in the cloud division, uh, Google Cloud Platform, as an editor. Um, I work... Right now, interestingly, I work primarily with engineers who are writing as opposed to full-time technical writers, but I work, that's my primary job, but I edit many different people. I actually started way back in the mid-80s in documentation. I, um, like some of your other guests, I got out of school and I kind of fell into the computer industry. Um, I was initially doing support and training, and then an opportunity came up to move into documentation, which I, I didn't even know it at the time, but that actually turned out to be the job I really wanted. Um, and so I stuck with that for many years. I started at a little database company in Seattle. Um, excellent training for me. Then I moved... Um, to uh, Asymmetrics, which was a Paul Allen company, and eventually ended up at Microsoft, where I was for 17 years in all. Then I spent a couple of years in at AWS uh, working on security docs there, which was fascinating work. Uh, I spent a couple of years at Tableau, which are the BI people, as you probably know, uh, and then ended up at Google. So, and I want to say, when I was at Microsoft, I, sorry, just a second, <laughs> sorry to interrupt you already. Um, when I was at Microsoft, I worked exclusively in the developer division, which was a bunch of products that had the word visual in front of them. So visual Fox, visual basic and stuff. And it was there that I made the transition from full-time writer to full-time editing uh, roughly 15 years ago. And then I've swapped back and forth between those two roles ever since. Fantastic. So that's uh, almost two decades, I should say, into documentation. I mean, of course, you switched roles, but uh, uh, roughly two decades. Is that uh, uh, fair to say? No, it's or actually more? it's actually yeah, it's it's more than three now. <laughs> Fantastic. Fair. So I think uh, uh, I'm going to bring a lot of memories back to you. Hopefully, okay. uh, so so let's stick to Google maybe to start with. So what's your documentation process at Google, and who is normally involved in such process defining stages? Right. So, and I have to be careful to to say that anything that I'm talking about is really going to be primarily associated with the cloud division, right? So that's going to be developer oriented docs, um, and cloud, of course, is often very enterprise focused. So I don't know how they do documentation in the in the Gmail group and so forth. Um, so we um, we actually have a culture that of documentation that tries to put us close to where the developers are. So the writers themselves are embedded with the development teams. And we use some of the same tools that the developers themselves use. So we have a check-in system for code that you know goes through, uh, you, people check in code and then they get it reviewed before it can be uh, released into the depot. And we use a similar process for docs. Uh, our docs happen to be in Markdown for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, it's a similar situation. The writers compose and then they they stage things, they go through an approval process, and then it's merged into the, the big depot. So the, the big depot is a really big depot that contains everything. So there's a a very large collection of all the docs are in one place. Again, talking for cloud primarily. Um, in my job, because I, as I mentioned I, earlier, I was um, I work a lot with engineers. They do a lot of work in Google Docs, and then we eventually just convert it over to Markdown and work from there. Does that is that what you're looking for? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, the, the, that's uh, that's roughly uh, the process I was looking for, Mike. And uh, how, how do you manage your documentation workflow? You did mention that very similar to development team, you have a very structured way of uh, getting things done, approval, and a proper workflow. But can you would you be able to elaborate a little bit more on that, Mike? Well, it's this. It's interesting because you know, cloud consists of many, many, many different services. So the writers are embedded with the teams, and the exact process that any given doc set will come to life is going to vary by team. So some of them work very closely with the writers; they'll do um, stand-ups with them and so forth. Some of them may be um, 
you know, they may have a, a, a different relationship, may work more with directly with the PMs. Um, but the, the ultimate process in terms of the mechanics remains the same. They produce a doc plan. They produce uh, uh, an idea of what the doc set is that they want to that they want to uh, publish next. Then they draft. People use uh, text editors often with Markdown. They'll draft the docs, and then they will go through a series of review processes. Actually, there'll be a, an SME review, and then ultimately uh, another writer or an editor will have to go through and make sure that that's okay. Our publishing process is actually um, very surprisingly, um, I guess, agile, you'd call it, in the sense that uh, every group can publish on their own. Uh, like, for example, I can pick up a document, I can create it or edit it or whatever, and once it's approved, I can shove it in the depot, and then it, it, it can be published right then and there. So people can be publishing all different times. The constraints of that are, are more um, according to, for example, I'm working on a product, and it's not yet ready to be released, so obviously I don't want to publish just yet. Uh, mm -hmm. Or conversely, uh, there's a conference coming up, and we have a bunch of announcements to make, so we have to make sure that we make everything is published right then and there. But it's all there's no huge, although we have centralized tools for managing all of the flow, it's up to the individual teams to figure out when they want to publish stuff. Yeah, that I make understand. Sense? Yes, absolutely, Mike. I think this is. Uh, I, I think at this point, uh, let's talk a little bit more about your role change uh, or shifting between different roles. So, how would you uh, just talk a little bit more about uh, uh, editing and its role in technical writing? Okay. Um, so in my experience, and uh, most people, most technical writers don't necessarily have the luxury, let's call it, of having a dedicated editing resource to help them. Uh, many groups that I've worked with have done peer editing or something equivalent. So with editing, you get a very clear separation of responsibilities. In our case, we think of editing as uh, a, a teamwork that we do with the writer to help them express what it is they actually want to express. Um, it's very easy, I'm sure many of your writers know, to write things down and then you, to you, everything seems correct. Mm -hmm. You, you know, that's, you wrote it that way, you organized it that way because that would seem like correct. You really need somebody else to come in and have a look at it. So we think of ourselves in terms of editing as being the first readers of a document. So we're, we're taking a, we're walking up to it kind of cold and saying, okay, well, it does or doesn't make sense or whatever. Um, there's a lot of small mechanics associated with language and stuff, but we're much more interested in uh, what the, is the document succeeding in what the writer is intending to do? Um, is the, is the, problem that the documentation solves clearly stated is the audience at which it's aimed is that clear from the beginning we talk about um a fail fast which means that i'm uh, i'm a user i'm you know searching my way and i land on a topic i should know within the first paragraph or two is this the document that is answering the problem that i'm here for and is it actually aimed at somebody like me like, I shouldn't have to read three pages into a document to discover, oh, wait, this is actually intended for Python programmers, and I'm not even a Python programmer, mm -hmm. or something like that. So that's, we're much interested in, in trying to minimize the amount of time that the reader has to spend on a document um, so that they can solve their problem. Maybe they can leave this document and find a different one. So as editing, one of the things we're helping to do then is shape helping shape the documentation with the reader in mind. Understand. So uh, I think the next question I have here or in my mind might be relating to what you just spoke. So how can working as part of a creative team improve documentation? So you clearly explained about your editing editor role. Um, so when it comes to creative team, um, uh, how, how does it help with your documentation? So we there's a couple ways. One is that um, we develop um, content models. We help to develop content models. There's an IA. We have an IA, but we have content models for different. You know, and as, as I'm sure your your uh, your listeners know, you know, there's conceptual documents. There's going to be um, tutorials, reference docs, how to. These all have different shapes. Uh, we want to make sure then that the readers understand. The, that if they go to a particular document, that's the kind of information they get. So we help develop content models 
to guide the writer toward the appropriate model for the type of information that they're uh, conveying. We have a style guide, which <laughs> which people tend to think of as this kind of it's a you know it's the police of the documentation, but really what it is, it's a bunch of pre-made decisions. Um, you know, we've decided after working with many writers and with the other editors that the way we want to express something is this way, or we definitely don't want to use this term or whatever. I'm going to stop right there and put a little footnote on that. Like, for example, we've really, mm -hmm. um, in the last year, we've worked a lot on inclusive language. I don't know if you've talked to your listeners about this. So there's a lot of terms that are traditional in our industry, but if you examine them, uh, people find them objectionable for various reasons. Um, sort of the, the classic example is the, are the terms whitelist and blacklist, which are very common in developer documentation, but they set up a kind of dichotomy that's a little uncomfortable for people. So we've been urging writers to get away from that kind of terminology toward more inclusive language. So right now we're using, for example, the words allow list and block list. So we're looking out after, uh, so we create this model. We're looking out after a bunch of terminology that that is helpful to the writers, that is helpful to the Google brand, and of course, it's supposed to be helpful to the readers as well. Um, and then we're also engaged in an effort to help writers become better writers. Um, the editing process is, in effect, an education process for writers, or it can be if they want it to be, I guess I should say, so that um, if you give me a document and I come back to you and I say, these are potential improvements for your consideration, then you and I can talk about it. Then maybe the next time you do a document, you'll say, okay, I remember from the last time that, oh, we wanted the fail fast section at the top or something like that. And so we're, we're helping spread through the organization, a culture of quality writing. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. That's, uh, that's quite elaborative, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> but that's nice. Nice to hear. Um, so there will be a lot of factors to consider, right, when creating documentation. Um, yes. What's the important ones for you? Um, I think it comes back down to the, the two questions of that I, I kind of alluded to earlier is like, what problem is the documentation trying to solve? Um, you have to have something in mind about what the user is trying to do. And then, as I said, the other one is like, who are you actually talking to? Um, mm. It makes a big difference in terms of the information you provide and how you provide it. Yeah. So I think uh, based on who's consuming your documentation and what's mm -hmm. the documentation aimed at, fantastic. Exactly. Um, so... Um, I'm sure uh, you may not relate this to the current experience, but uh, overall from uh, uh, more than three decades of uh, your documentation experience, have you seen any kind of um, workload reduction um, in introducing quality documentation? That is an excellent question because, it, among other things, it raises the question of how do you know that your documentation is working? And that's a that can be kind of a tricky question, as I'm sure people know. You you have metrics, obviously, uh, mm -hmm. in the form of analytics, right? But interpreting what the analytics are tell are telling you is not necessarily a straightforward process. Um, you you potentially have customer feedback through support channels or directly through bug reports or something like that. Uh, and then occasionally, but not nearly as often, I think, as most writers would like, you have the opportunity to actually talk to real customers uh, about what they're doing. And that is super valuable. So you have this set of tools that can sometimes be a little difficult to work correctly. And how do you get better? Well, we know that there's certain principles uh, that we know that if, if you keep, uh, if you write clearly, if you, I'm sorry, by clearly, I mean, you write short sentences, you, you stick to consistent vocabulary and stuff. There's no question that the documentation becomes better. It becomes better, not just for your, uh, for example, the people who are in the same language, who are reading in the same language that you're writing. It becomes easier for people who are reading it in a different, you know, reading it as a second language, right? Or eventually, mm -hmm. of course, for localization. Um, does it help? Yes, there's no question about it. Can I give you any kind of hard number about that? That's kind of tricky. 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. So I had a guest uh, a couple of days ago and uh, they come from a customer support background as well. So for them, it was an easy, easy way to measure the number of support tickets reduced, right. more repetitive questions as per the customer reduces and right. they take the... Right. So I can tell you that there's certain fixes we can make to the document that reduce the bug counts for a set of documents. Um, but whether I can extrapolate from that to say, ah, that means I should do this thing for other doc sets that I'm working with. It's a little, it's, I can't tell you that. I'm sure that there are numbers floating around that tell us about the number of support tickets associated with different doc sets. I don't actually see those. There is a team in the cloud division that's kind of devoted to that task, but I don't see those. So I don't know. I can't stand here and tell you, oh yeah, absolutely. It reduces support tickets. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so just a little bit about your reporting. Um, what do you report on your documentation or how do you report and who do you normally report to? So we, what happens is the analytics, uh, the, the documentation is, is instrumented extremely thoroughly, um, not just for the traditional types of analytics that we do, but a lot of internal kind of analytics so that we know, anyway, internal analytics. Um, so that information is available. It flows into a central uh, analytics site, I guess you'd call it, uh, which looks a lot like the external Google analytics sites, not surprisingly. Um, and people can go make use of that as they will. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Um, so it's in a sense up to individual teams to determine how how they want to look at the analytics and what they want to interpret from them and how they want to respond to them. Um, we, for example, we use a, a really trivial example of how we use the analytics is that um, if it's time to update a pretty old document, do we want to invest the time in actually putting a writer resource on it or not? Well, one of the things we'll look at is, are, what are the analytics on this thing? Is, are, is anybody even reading it, right? as best we can interpret from the, from the information that we have? And if not, well, then maybe we can just, um, as we call it, icebox the documentation. Stick it in the icebox for now and wait to see what happens. That's a trivial example, as I say. Um, I'm not... One thing I cannot tell you right now is to what extent analytics plays into the overall planning for a new doc set. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, just out of uh, curiosity, uh, just wanted to know, how do you uh, keep track of all these um, uh, analytics, for example, like whether the docs are being used um, or how frequently are the docs being used by customers? Uh, does your current platform support these analytics out of the box? Yes. Um, as I said, we, I mean, we've the documents are in, instrumented very, very thoroughly, um, and and then we have this site that does look a lot like the like the Google Analytics site for external uh, consumers, um, so that um, you can go, you can drill down for doc sets or in, all the way down to individual docs, and then you can do that across you know a thirty day period, across a two year period, however you want. So mm -hmm. everything you know about Google Analytics, we do plus more numbers on top of that. Understand, understand. Super. So um, any organic search traffic being generated from your knowledge base that you're aware of? Yeah, I don't, I'm afraid I don't have much information on that. I mean, I can echo what, for example, uh, Chris Gales was telling you, which was that uh, the, the majority of our traffic does come from organic search. Um, and then and then we have, you know, you'll see a lot of high bounce rates, which suggests to us that they're going off someplace else from where we are. Uh, but I don't know any more than that. Sorry. Okay, that's no problem, uh, Mike. That's absolutely fine. Uh, so I think uh, we are good to move to the rapid fire round. Um, oh, of so course, so. if there's anything to cover, uh, we can uh, we will uh, talk about it uh, just after these three questions, if you don't mind. Okay. Super. So who have you learned the most about documentation from in your career? I did tell you that I'm going to bring a lot of your memories back. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? So, so uh, I thought a little bit about this. This is a harder question than I thought it would be. So there's a cookbook in the United States that's really well known called The Joy of Cooking. Are you familiar with this cookbook? It was, mm. it was, a, uh, it was originally written back in the 1930s, and it was very novel for its time. Uh -huh. um, and I, sometimes I tell people, it's like everything I ever learned about technical writing, I learned from The Joy of Cooking. Because... 
the authors innovated many things, like they had conceptual explanations, they had clear procedures, they had notes and warnings, they had a you know, very effective use of illustrations, and a bunch of things like that that I must have internalized at some point in my early life, because I, I feel like, every, as I say, everything I learned came from that book. So that's, that's kind of my jokey answer, although I will emphasize that um, a good way for technical writers to learn technical writing is to read good technical writing. So, and I thought again about it, uh, Part of the problem I have is that, you know, I've been in this so long and I've worked with so many people, it's very difficult to um, to pinpoint individual people who made me aware of fundamental things. I will say this, though. So the first mm, seven or eight years I was in technical writing, I worked in a group. We didn't have editors. I had uh, peer reviewers. And, you know, of course, we were very proud of what we produced. And so then I went to a group that had editors. And uh, in particular, they had a couple of... Um, editors who had trained at, at big companies like Apple and Aldis, which is now Adobe and stuff. And oh boy, was that ever an eye-opening lesson to be to be put into the hands of professionals who understood technical writing, understood what the goals were, and then taught me appropriately. So if I had to pick some particularly influential people in my career, I would say it was those first couple of editors that I had who, and not because of the editing part so much is because they taught me fundamentals about, you know, doc design, about procedures, about mechanics of writing and so forth. But there have been many other people that, you know, I, I work with a lot of people who are a lot smarter than I am and I learn something every day. Mm, super. <laughs> That's true. Every day is a new beginning and every occasion is an opportunity to learn and move forward. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> good, good. So, can you share a documentation related resource you have consumed recently? I'm sure you will be reading quite a lot. <laughs> and <you're really> <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, you know, the, the, the easy answer for me is I look in the style guide about 15 times a day, um, which is, <laughs> you know, that's, that's a trivial one. And, I was, and again, I thought about this. Um, and I, so one of your other guests had talked about this too, about going to conferences. So at Google, we have an internal writers conference that we have every year, um, which brings together all of the technical writers from all over the company. So as I say, we're I'm clustered in the cloud division, but there are people in, uh, you know, consumer in, you know, working on devices, uh, Android and everything. And I... So, and it made me think about this because I saw some presentations at the most recent one, which was, of course, of course virtual since nobody can get together anymore, right? <laughs> um, there was this fantastic presentation from a UX team that was talking about uh, designing products for people in different cultures. So, you know, it's very difficult. You know, we, I can talk to other people in the cloud division. But at the end of the day, we have roughly the same audience and we're, you know, writing roughly the same kind of documentation. So talking to somebody who's designing an app for a phone, they tell you about the kinds of problems that they face in terms of talking to their audience. And you're like, oh, my gosh, um, you know, these people have entirely different approach to technology. They interpret visual information very differently from the way we do. You know, they read text quite differently. It was super fascinating. And not so much about the individual details. I mean, they were very interesting. But to think, to take a step back and say, there's a whole world of people consuming information out there that is so different from what we deal with every day. And I think it's extremely valuable to have that experience of saying, oh, this is very different from what I'm used to, because it helps you kind of jar you a little bit out of your complacency about, oh, yes, I understand my audience and I understand what they need. Maybe you do, but there's a bigger world out there than what you know about. There was also, and there was another session there about interviewing technical writing candidates, which I wanted to sneak in real quickly. As, and I think about this a lot because we've worked on our interview process and so forth, our um, assessments. And I think there must be, there might be people out there who have kind of cracked the problem of how to hire technical writers. But as far as I know, we're still working on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So my last question before I have the final thank you note to you. So what is the one piece of documentation related advice you would give to your 20 year old self? So, <sighs> I think that <laughs> what I've learned over time is is that people the people who are consuming documentation don't actually want to be consuming documentation. There's a there's this maxim that I heard from someplace I don't even know where where it came from that it's never a business goal to read the documentation. 
people who are reading the documentation are trying to do something. They're trying to solve a problem. Maybe they've already tried to do it. And they turn to the documentation kind of as a last resort. You have to it's really important for us to provide information with that in mind. They're not, they don't want to be reading it. They're not going to read it very thoroughly unless they're forced to, to get a kind of scan through it. And really what they're looking for is they're looking for that one piece of information that solves their immediate problem. So our job is to reduce the time and the friction that, that gets them from their original question to the answer that they want. That's the goal. All everything else is just us. So, um, if I had known that at the beginning of my career, I would have written a lot less, but a lot better documentation. <laughs> Super, fantastic, Mike. So I don't, I didn't know how the last thirty minutes went by. So uh, it's very interesting. So if I have missed to ask anything um, in particular, please feel free to add. Uh, now, because um, no. it's very hard to grab everything from you in the short span of time, right? <laughs> no, I, 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 and I think I would echo what many of your listeners have said is that the, this is a fantastic resource, and I think it's, it's it's important for people to hear perspectives from all different kinds of people in the industry, what they're up to, how they're solving problems, um, and what kinds of interesting things they do every day. Fantastic. So thank you once again, Mike. I should definitely tell this. It's really early morning for you. You did mention it was 5.30 in the morning and yeah. I can't thank enough to uh, uh, for you to join at this early hour. And I'm so sorry if I kept you awake <laughs> the whole night. No, no. This, this has been very good fun. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you. Super. Thank you for your support and keep up the good work and stay safe. Okay. Bye-bye. Talk to you soon. Bye. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Knowledge Base Ninjas podcast. Please head to iTunes, rate, and provide honest feedback on the podcast. See you next week.